The glenohumeral joint, we will talk about the structure and actions of this joint. First structure, we'll identify the components of the glenohumeral joint, what makes up this joint and what supports this joint. And then as a result of the structure, the actions, we'll describe the movements of the glenohumeral joint. So, glenohumeral joint is a synovial joint. Two bones come together, wrapped in a synovial membrane, bathed in synovial fluid. The specific type of synovial joint is a ball and socket joint, which means we have a ball that articulates with a socket that allows it to move in all sorts of directions in this fashion. Okay? It is the most flexible or movable, movable synovial joint, has the greatest range of motion out of all the synovial joints, is in fact all the joints in the body. The components. First, there's a ball. The ball is the head of the humerus. The head of the humerus articulates with the socket, which is the glenoid cavity, forming the glenohumeral joint. Now the glenohumeral joint has this head, and it's quite a large head, as a matter of fact, that articulates with this glenoid cavity. But something that's unique about this joint is that only a third of the humeral head articulates with the glenoid cavity at a time. What does this mean? Thumbs up with regards to flexibility. Giddy up. It's got so much range of motion and very flexible. Flexion, extension, uh, abduction, adduction, medial, lateral rotation, and circumduction. But thumbs down on stability because of how um, little the humeral head articulates with that glenoid cavity. Uh, the is so so poorly stabilized that an analogy often used is that of a golf tee, a golf tee, and a golf ball. Well, the golf tee is the glenoid cavity, and the golf ball is the head of the humerus, looking like this. So, thumbs up on flexibility because look at how much movement that gets. But thumbs down on stability. So this begs the question: What structures are in place to help stabilize this? glenohumeral joint. Well, the following structures do that. The glenoid labrum, joint capsule, and those four ligaments getting their names for the bones that they articulate with. So let's go through each of these one by one. First one, the glenoid labrum. To teach this one, let's do an analogy. Glenoid labrum is like a bowl and toilet plunger. So how is it like a bowl? Let's go back to this analogy where the golf ball sitting on the tee. If we take a look at, whoa, it can go this way, or whoa, it can go this way. And because it's so unstable, you can get the ball to fall right off. So if we want to find a way to help make this so the ball, the golf ball wouldn't come off so much, what if we did this? What if we put a bowl on top of that golf tee so that when we put the golf ball inside that one, look at that. Now when it moves around, it's a little bit more stable and doesn't quite wobble back and forth as much. Well, the glenoid labrum is like a bowl. Again, the analogy of the golf ball is the head of the humerus. And the bowl is that glenoid labrum. And this glenoid labrum is this uh, fibrocartilaginous ring. It's a ring of tissue made of fibro fibrous cartilage that then articulates within this analogy the T, which is the scapula, that glenoid cavity. So let's move that glenoid labrum on, which then knits itself into the surrounding periosteum and bone and has attachment sites for a number of things for the uh, glenohumeral ligaments as well as the long head of the biceps tendon. We now add the head of the humerus on there. And because this glenoid labrum is just under a centimeter high or deep, better way of putting it, about nine millimeters, the glenoid labrum increases the depth of the glenoid cavity by about 50%. So, there's one of its functions. Another thing is the glenoid labrum is like a toilet plunger. So there's a plunger and we put a ball right there and if we put the ball in, it can suction cup inside that one. If you put a little fluid especially, like um, gross fluid from the toilet, it'll just stick right inside there. Well, the glenoid labrum uh, or this uh, pl plunger has the suction effect. The glenoid labrum is like a toilet plunger. When we put the two on there, there's a suction effect that helps keep the head of the humerus adhered to this inside that uh, socket joint. Okay, and finally, the glenoid labrum has an attachment of important tendon. So there's our biceps tendon. So the attachment of the biceps tendon, that long head, where we follow the long belly, and that long head goes to the inner tubercular groove, and then inside the capsule wraps around and attaches to the superglenoid tubercle, 
but also to the top of the glenoid labrum. So if we now have a view that we're looking smack on, facing face-to-face, nose-to-nose with the glenoid fossa, there is the glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa. And then that circular area in orange, that's the glenoid labrum. There is the biceps tendon. It comes and attaches all to that upper part of the glenoid labrum. All right, now the joint capsule, this joint capsule that surrounds this entire glenohumeral joint. Before we talk about that, let's take a wee detour to discuss synovial joint structure. Okay, so joint capsule. Here we have a bone that meets another bone, and where two bones meet, it's called a joint. And what surrounds this, or what's found articulating between these two bones in orange, that's hyaline cartilage or also known as articular cartilage. And that's what enables like bumpers and cars. So bone doesn't hit on bone, just like car metal doesn't hit car metal. Bumpers hit each other. That's articular cartilage. Now surrounding the shaft of the bone in purple is this dense collagenous connective tissue knitted into the compact bone by Sharpie fibers. We call that periosteum, peri-around osteum bone. That periosteum, better yet, that dense irregular collagenous connective tissue continues over to attach to the periosteum of the other bone. And so this dense connective tissue that I have in green that connects the periosteum we call is the joint capsule. And that joint capsule has lined internally by a synovial membrane that then produces synovial fluid that, that uh, bathes the inside of the joint. This is what makes this joint so flexible and movable. Now, that joint capsule is what pulls the glenohumeral joint together and it creates this intracapsular negative pressure that helps to keep that head of the humerus articulating inside uh, that glenohumeral joint. Um, now if we take the humerus and we just take periosteum that then becomes the joint capsule that then becomes the periosteum, there we have the joint capsule around the glenohumeral joint with synovial fluid bathing the inside of this. Something I want you to notice along the bottom is here is this axillary fold. Now that axillary fold is there because watch what happens in this joint capsule when we go to AB duct. There's got to be some, because this is so flexible, there has to be some laxity in this joint capsule and able to do that movement. However, the problem is this increased risk of dislocation by having this axillary fold and being specifically this axillary fold increases the risk of dislocation inferiorly in an inferior direction because it's not so tight. All right, some other structures is the coracohumeral ligament. So on this picture, there's the coracoid process of the scapula and there's the humerus. And the ligament that connects the coracoid process to the humerus is appropriately called the coracohumeral ligament. And this, what this helps to do is if you're then pulling yanking uh, force through the humerus down, that ligament helps to stabilize and keep the head of the humerus in the socket. Next is the coracochromial ligament, attaching between the coracoid process and the acromion or acromial process going between the two. And what this does is help us. We've got the humeral head pushing up as if forcing the humeral head up towards the joint. It helps then give stability to keep the head uh, within the joint. Then we have this other one that courses between the coracoid process and the clavicle called the coracoclavicular ligament. And it helps anchor that clavicle inferiorly to ensure that it articulates at that joint. And this joint is known as your acromial clavicular ligament, and it helps to keep the clavicle uh, articulating with the scapula. This is extremely important because it's one of the primary joints that articulates the upper limb to the axial skeleton. All right, so now that we've got this st uh, the structure of it, let's talk about that there are all these actions that the glenohumeral joint can do, as shown in these illustration. Now, this uh, glenohumeral joint will allow flexion and extension, abduction and adduction, and medial and lateral rotation. So let's go through each of these. In this lateral view of the right upper limb, there is flexion as the arm goes forward, and there is extension. Flexion, extension. Great. Then abduction and adduction. And so there is abduction, moving the humerus away from the midline, adduction, moving the humerus towards the midline. Abduction, adduction. And finally, medial or internal rotation and lateral or external rotation. So medial rotation is when the humerus goes medially. Lateral rotation, it rotates laterally. Medial or internal rotation, 
lateral or external rotation. Let's take a look at this from an anterior view. There is medial rotation, there's lateral rotation. And let's add the same thing on medial rotation, lateral rotation. Medial, lateral. So what we've now just covered is the structure of that glenoral humeral joint as well as the, what supports that joint as well as the actions accomplished by this glenohumeral joint.